You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is documentary filmmaker Trip Jennings. And we're going to be talking about Elemental. Uh, reimagine Wildfire. <laughs> How do we reimagine Wildfire, Trip? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's what the film's all about. So, you know, it's a... Uh... It's an onion to unravel how we reimagine this, this uh, force. Yes. Yes. You know, when this came, when Annie sent this to me immediately, I wanted to do this interview. I live in California and, um, and we've had many, many, I'm in Santa Barbara and we've had our share of wildfires here, surely. But before that I'd lived in uh, Carmel by the sea near Big Mm -hmm. Sur which we've had many, many uh, wildfires there. And I happened to be in Napa when the Paradise fire broke out. And we could see, the, I mean, the smoke and the flames were just even there. We're, we're amazing that were carried over from the Paradise fire. And I think that's how this movie got started. So let's, let's talk a little bit about why you decided this movie to do this movie. And, um, and then we'll go from there. Cause I have lots of questions for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you sure have, um, you've kind of run the gamut of, of lots of different fire prone areas and lots of different fires. I mean, um, yeah, the Thomas fire right, right uphill from Santa Barbara, um, not too long ago. Uh, the largest fire uh, in the state at the time. So, um, yeah, so so in 2017, there were a handful of very destructive fires, right? Mm -hmm. The Tubbs Fire um, in Northern California and a much less destructive fire just 40 miles east of where I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, And, you know, and that was kind of the first time that we as Portlanders had experienced this this thing. It was no longer a California problem, right? Um, and and there were ashes raining down on the city. Uh, we had to go, you know, scrub off our windows just to see the drive. And that was just something we hadn't experienced before, right? And so for me, like I had done a student film about a, a, a fire in Southern Oregon 15 years earlier in college. I knew a little bit still from that. Um, but as as people started talking about you know, what do we do? Why don't we see more air tankers flying, you know, in the windiest conditions, sort of all, all this um, stuff. I, I just began to realize that the public discourse and what I sort of knew as the best available science about fire, that there was this huge gap in between the two. And and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, with the Tubbs fire just a little bit uh, uh, later and then, you know, this fire in near me this is this fire landscape is changing and this gap between of understanding this gap between the discourse the cultural narrative and the science i think that's going to get people killed i think that's going to make people you know lose their homes if we don't sort of change what we're doing and then a year later the campfire really solidified that for everybody right i mean that was this moment Nineteen thousand structures 86 people died and I just came to realize so quickly, we've got to change what we're doing. We're using this outdated playbook, this outdated cultural narrative for a climate of the past. And that's not what we live in. And so, so what do we do? So what's our way out? And, you know, I was amazed in reporting this and in creating this story that there's actually a really sort of a happy ending. I mean, this is, uh, although, you know, we're not completely ready for wildfires, there is a path forward mm-hmm. where we can live, you know, and, and thrive in landscapes that are going to burn because every terrestrial landscape is going to burn eventually, right? Um, and so that's that's what we put down in the film. And I really hope people watch it because I think it's going to help make people safer. Oh, I agree. I agree. You You brought in a number of different experts in this and um and i'm i'm afraid i might mispronounce uh the y- yurok the yurok yeah yurok totally. uh let, i really want to talk about each of the different as- experts that you brought in and what their thoughts have been and you know because there, there's a lot in this film uh and you're right it doesn't make any difference whether i mean obviously california oregon 
uh, you know, Washington state and, you know, on the West coast, well, maybe not Washington because they get a lot of rain there, but, um, you know, it, it, no, it's really a problem all over the country. I mean, is. we're starting to see fires in, even in new England exactly. and, you know, there was a, a huge fire in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, not too long ago, right. That destroyed, you know, hundreds of homes. So yeah, it's, it, you know, the more the climate warms, the more we're seeing, um, this is a risk all over the place. Yeah, I, I had uh, my neighbor uh, who lived across the street and has three children. Her daughter was an infant. She was driving from Carmel by the sea to Washington during that fire and had, mm. to, and had her story about getting through Oregon uh, during that fire that, you know, it, it, mm. I don't even, I mean, I said, why didn't you just wait another day? <laughs> and hope yeah, you you right. went up there. You know, I mean, it, what she made it thank god lots of praying through that but that was horrific um you know because people couldn't get gas there were no hotels there was no place to stop and you show that with tires popping and everything that i mean that's pretty amazing and yeah t- talk about that i mean how did you get some of this footage yeah you know people um I- i'm so grateful to everyone who shared their stories of evacuating paradise and also in the 2020 fires in Oregon um, were the two main sort of escapes that we focused on from these fires. And it is so harrowing. I mean, you're asking someone to share with you not only their thoughts and experience, but also their voice and the recording of the, you know, their experience from, from phones so often Mm -hmm. of the most terrifying moments of their life. And I'm, you know, yeah, I am really grateful to people for sharing that. And I think that, you know, the thing that we heard over and over, even just in the filming process, was that it was really therapeutic for people to have the opportunity to sit and just talk for an hour and a half or two hours about their experience. And I think that really helps. I mean, I I love the interview process. I love creating documentaries for that reason, you know, even just that alone, because you do get to have this very intimate moment with someone and you just listen without judgment. I mean, they're talking about something that I can't, it's hard for me to imagine, even though I've heard so many stories, right? And you just make the decisions that you make using you know, your best judgment. And, um, and these folks all got out alive, obviously, um, but it was yeah. terrifying. And, and so, so yeah, I think after that, you kind of bond. I mean, like, I just feel so, so like kind of emotionally close to someone who's been so vulnerable um, in that conversation. And I think it really helps them process the experience a bit Mm -hmm. to be able to just, you know, say it all in one go. And so, you know, as a result, we have very real testimonies to what it's like. And, and, you know, for me, that's just, it just underscores how important it is Honestly, for people to, I think, to see this film and make a really informed decision about what we can do to make sure those never happen again. I don't want anyone to have to evacuate and think that they are never going to see their children again, even though they're in the car with them. I mean, I I still, I cry when I see, uh, when I watch the first 12 minutes of this film still, and I've seen it hundreds of times. Um, but then it gets so hopeful, you know, towards the end of the to middle end of the film, like there are real solutions and we, we actually can do this. We can. And that's what's so great that you do, you know, you don't just go through this story without offering some kind of solution to the problem, you know, which, which I mean, that's what I said. Everybody's wonderful to working on it. Let's talk about each of the experts and what their thoughts are about, you know, reimagining wildfires. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned the Yurok, and yes. Um, so, I just—I mean, I can't thank the Yurok, you know, tribal members that sort of like took me in under their wing and told me what they know about fire. I learned so much from them, and I have so much deep respect um, for the the you know the Cultural Fire Management Council, um, which is an organization that they they use to um, do to to basically do these burns all over their homeland and one of the things that's so special and i think maybe even unique in the united states is the yurok have never been displaced from their traditional homeland right so many native 
um, peoples were forcibly removed from their land, right? Um, and and you know we we I think in many ways, especially even in the fire realm, we're still dealing with the consequences of that, um, and certainly they are today. And the Europe, you know, the Northern California was just so remote, right? And so they've been there. They were forced not to do burning for a little while. But what it means is that they have a, a knowledge of the ecosystem, of the place that they live that is deeper than anything I've ever really experienced and, and I've ever seen, you know? And so they've been um, kind of restarting and um, rejuvenating this, you know, 10,000 year old for however long practice of burning, not only for safety, but also for um, resource production, like um, tools uh, to make, to weave baskets, um, to open up prairies for elk, um, to hunt, and, uh, but also for, for home safety, right? So they're burning. I mean, it's amazing today. They know the weather so well, they're able to burn right up to their homes, like really within just, um, you know, so close to their homes. And, uh, and that's really, I think, keeping them safe um, in ways that it's hard for us to imagine, you know, if you live in Santa Barbara or, <laughs> or, uh, or LA or Oregon, Portland, you know, um, specifically. And so what's, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for them for how they would sort of reimagine wildfire. But what I learned from them is that, you know, this is a tool that and, and an element that, that is, it exists and we can't stop it, but we can work with it. And that was, that was so deeply impactful to me. And I thank them forever for, you know, taking me in. And, and, and so I actually ended up getting my, uh, as a result of filming with them, I got my um, wildfire, wildfire um, certification, firefighting certification. And I went and, you know, got to hold a drip torch and burn with them, which was amazing. Um, and, and you know, sort of participate a little bit in that, like that experience. Yeah, because it's ceremonial too. Right. Yeah. 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 And and there's there's um right there's ceremony before the fire. There's sort of like this, um, you know, the burning. You know, itself is sort of is this prayer. Um, and you know, it's I just don't come from a culture that is as as land based and as knowledgeable, but also. You know, it's like head and heart knowledge that I got to sort of just experience firsthand from from my like, you know, my sort of outsider's description of it, I guess. They're, well, they're beautiful people. So, you know, and that comes through, too, in, in this film, uh, for sure. But, you, you know, they, then they, let's go on to uh, Dr. Beverly Law and talk mm. a bit about her. Well, Dr. Law, um, you know, her, I think she's one of the kind of unsung heroes about how we should understand climate and forests. I mean, she changed the, the, this global understanding of forests and carbon storage. It was thought before her work that young forests um, sequestered more carbon more quickly than old forests. And she has these towers, I mean, you can see in the film, she has these towers that do actual observations of how much carbon goes into the forest and how much carbon leaves the forest. And instead of doing modeling, she said, well, let's go actually observe it. And it turned out that old forests, as she said, are the workhorses. They absorb all of this carbon. And I'll just do a quick you know, explanation of that, right? It's like a bank account. Would you rather have a million dollar bank account growing at 4% interest or a hundred dollar bank account growing at 7% interest, right? I'd take the million dollars at 4% any day. And that's the same thing that we're doing with carbon in the forest. And that just turned the, the understanding on its head. And now she's doing this research that shows that fire actually um, releases a lot less carbon than we used to think, right? So, so I mean, we can think of Beverly Law, Dr. Beverly Law, as just really completely changing. I think our perspective. She's she had to, I don't know if she had to reimagine or she just had to do the science and say what it said. You know, the science found, but um, 
but it helps me reimagine our relationship with wildfire and reimagine what wildfire means, right? Because it doesn't, it's not climate game over like we thought it was. Well, I think a lot of the thinking of how to prevent these forest fires or wildfires um, has changed over time. And that's what you're showing in this film, that the thinking is changing about how we do manage them. And that's what was, you know, I mean, as you say, you know, the happy ending is that there are things that we can do, but we're not going to get to the happy ending yet. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we will. We'll save that to the, towards the end of this interview <laughs> with you. But then, but she, her work, it, it was really interesting. I thought it was, it was just fascinating how her work is really changing the way that people, they are reimagining uh, forest fires and, and what were what what you know exactly the older trees which people thought you know it's like older you know older uh, adults <laughs> <laughs> we're still the workhorses <laughs> and so much important I mean it's like it's knowledge it's you know you might have more energy when you're twenty but you probably can get more done when you're fifty or <laughs> so right because you're just uh, you know how to do it really well. Yeah. No shade to any of the generations, right? Like we all got to come up, but that's just kind of the way it is. It is. Well, you get, you know, you become wiser as you become older, uh, as mm -hmm. they say. Sometimes not everybody does, but yeah, fair enough. speaking, you know, you hope that's the hope that we become wiser as we get older. Uh, let's talk about Dr. Jack Cohen um, and, and his findings and, and, what he had to say about yeah so jack is um i mean what what an amazing person like a real visionary you know for 30 years uh his career in the forest service he researched how do homes burn down in wildfires and how can we stop it and it's funny because you know 30 years ago it was sort of a novel idea right like there were like Dr. Law, um, he was challenging these, he took these assumptions and he said, well, homes burn down because you know, the assumption was a fire moves through a community and the flames engulf a house and it burns up and then the fire engulfs the next house. And so he took that assumption and he tested it. And that's what so many of the people in this film are doing. They're taking our, our traditional assumptions and they're saying, well, have we tested those scientifically? Is it a story, a narrative that no longer holds true? And so much of it is true. It is, you know, especially as we move into this novel climate, mm -hmm. you know, as the world gets hotter and drier in many cases, California got wetter for a time, but, you know, we'll go back. Um, we have to retest all of these theories. And so, so Jack, um, I mean, he really sort of pioneered this understanding of how fire moves in a community that it's not a wall of flames, it's an ember. And if it's an ember, a small ember, then what you need to do is very different. You need to prevent that ember from getting inside of your home. And you need to prevent that ember from landing on something that will burn, ignite, and then burn your house down, right? And so, and that, with that understanding, we have so much potential. And, and he didn't do it in a lab. Well, he did do it in a lab, but he didn't do it theoretically, right? He did it and this is sort of a documentarian's dream, right? Because there's actually this footage from the 90s that we dug up. We had to go to the fire lab in Missoula and we had to go to their archives and we had to spend a couple of days looking through this footage to find Jack's initial experiments where he burns down entire blocks of forest with you know these things that sort of represent homes to see how far you had to be from this huge wildfire to be safe, that your home wouldn't burn down. And it's so much closer than you'd expect. Watch the film to see. Right. But um, And then he went to South Carolina to this research facility called the Institute for Business and Home Safety, where they build homes and they test them against all sorts of weather threats, like hurricanes and tornadoes and hail. And they created this machine that would mimic um, real wildfire conditions, really realistic wildfire conditions of throwing embers at homes. So they build these homes, they, they blast them with embers and they figure out the weak points and they figure out how to change those to make it safe. And, 
you know, spoiler alert, but it turns out you don't have to live in a concrete ammo bunker to be safe, you know, from wildfires and, and wildfire prone areas. Um, and so that's, I mean, I guess we did get to the happy ending. Yeah. I don't know if that was too early for you. That's but, all right. Um, <laughs> well, but yeah, I mean, and, and the funny thing, okay, so, but here's the funny thing about Jack, right? Is that, is that Jack, I think he will be the first to say it. Um, you know, he's grumpy. He's been <laughs> screaming at the top of his lungs. Hey, I figured out how to prevent this for 30 years. And he's largely, and not been ignored, but if we had implemented the things that he figured out when he figured them out, right. there would be hundreds, if not thousands of people alive who are not. And there would be, you know, tens of thousands of homes and structures that would still be standing. Right. So right. he, I think, deserves to be frustrated <laughs> and he deserves to blow off documentarians when <laughs> they call him and they say, they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and they're like, I'm going to make a film about this. And he's like, yeah, sure, kid. Um, so I'm so grateful, though, that it took years. It took a few years. It took going to Missoula a bunch of times. Um, but Jack is really on board now. And that is exciting. Oh, that's he's, interesting. I, that it took a couple of years for you to get him to to do this. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah you know, he did. He did an initial interview right away. Um, but he really didn't open up for a few years. It took two, a couple of years. And because he'd probably, you know, as you say, he did this for 30 years and nobody was listening to him. So he's like, oh, well, here's somebody else who may not be listening after all of this. Yeah, right. And I think just coming back to him over and over with good questions and like, we really want to get this right. Can we keep, can we do one more interview? Can we do this in the field? Can we do it in a different place? Um, and you know, what's, that's one of the most gratifying things for me is like, Jack is really a folk hero in the fire service. Like I, I have firefighters who watch the film come up to me and he's, they're just like, it was so cool to see Jack Cohen be so, you know, there's so much of him and, and, you know, talk about his career and his discoveries, right. Because they influence firefighters decisions so much. Um, and now to have Jack really kind of on board and, liking the film and really pushing it out there as well. It's very gratifying to me. Yes, it should be. It should be, you know, to go back. I mean, we, we've been talking about climate change, you know, for, you know, Earth Day was 1970 and that started oh. here in Santa Barbara, which I was not aware of that it started here. And this year for Earth Day, they didn't, haven't had the celebration for a couple of years, obviously. Jane Fonda came and she spoke. Oh, and, you know, cool. she's so passionate, you know, about climate change. You know, she's been arrested, I don't know how many times for her, uh, what does she call them? I don't know, uh, Fire Drill Fridays, I think. Is oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. And before the pandemic, she was even doing them during the pandemic. But right. you kind of look and you go, why haven't? we paid attention. You know, why is it taking so long? How did we, we knew over 50 years ago or longer, you know, yeah. that we needed to do something to try to stop this climate change. And yet we've done, you know, we've done little things, but we certainly haven't done what we need. And now we're running, beginning to run out of time. The clock is certainly ticking on this for sure. So I, I, my little pontificating here, but I do want to get back because this couple who decided to build a home in the forest, I want you to talk about their home mm. and what happened to them, because I think that's really one of the happy endings is what. They yeah, that's true. Yeah. So um, in 2020, there were fires that came through Oregon that were just pretty unimaginably devastating. Now, more structures burned in paradise but we're talking about rural communities with one way out because there's just you know there's a canyon and a river and you live next to the river and um mary bradshaw lived really almost at the end of the road before it becomes forest service land and is wilderness um and built a home um in a place called elkhorn and in Oregon. And um, that corridor saw 100 mile an hour winds with this raging wildfire. And you can see, I mean, her whole community was destroyed. You know, homes just burned to foundations and every tree is black. 
I mean, it is, it's a rare thing in fires to see. I mean, it looks like near a hundred percent mortality of, of trees. And, and then, you know, there's this drone shot right from right after the fire. Um, and you just are flying over this absolute destruction and you see it in the film. And then her house is just, it's the sole survivor. And she just did all of the things, you know, it's such a testament to the fact that this science is real, mm -hmm. you know, tested in the most extreme conditions. Um, she doesn't have wood decks. She doesn't have uh, vents that go into her attic that embers can get into. She has multi-pane windows so that, you know, if something hits a single pane window, breaks the window, an ember flies inside, burns the home from the inside out, right? And so, you know, all these little details. And it's not that you have to build it of some special material. Right. You know, hardy plank or, you know, all sorts of different um, right. siding is just metal, fine. Yeah, the metal roof and everything. Oh, you know what? We um, for, Unfortunately, I have many more questions. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. But where can people see Elemental? Um, reimagine wildfires well thanks for the question so um it's streaming on june 13th on apple and amazon the apple pre-order is already up we would love for people to go there and pre-order it that helps us out so much and it helps everybody else out because the more people that see this and do the work your neighbors for example right. do the work and they're going to keep everybody safer yeah. um so please check it out and thank you so much this has been a fun conversation Thank you. It was a pleasure having you on the show trip. Everybody seek this film out because you'll learn a lot and um, and perhaps save your life or someone else's life by watching the film. Thank you so much, Trip, for doing this work, the work that you do. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Yes, you too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.